good morning, everybody. Uh, as heard, I'm Dr. Joel Roos. I'm the Vice President for International Accreditation for Joint Commission International. Brief by way of background, I am an emergency physician, and before coming to Joint Commission, I actually spent 30 years in the U.S. Navy where I held a variety of senior leadership positions. And today I'm going to talk to you about a question that we get asked a lot. And we're talking about the future of accreditation, but I would, uh, or beyond accreditation, and I would tell you, you probably can't go beyond until you know where you're at. And, and what I mean by that is, what are, the, what are the trends and findings that we as an organization that surveys internationally find most frequently? And so in this brief uh, time frame, I'm gonna to talk to you about uh, findings for 2022. And as a brief outline of what I'm gonna talk about, I'm gonna explain how we did it, share our top 10 findings, uh, give you a little uh, insight in some of the deeper aspects, and then point you to some additional resources. So, what did we do? So in terms of analyzing the results, we looked at all hospital and academic medical center accreditations that were conducted in 2022, which was a total of 206 hospitals. We then summarized all of the findings from their surveys uh, during this time frame, and then we applied our uh, impact analysis tool, the Safer Matrix, which I will talk to you about in depth, and then from that collated the top 10 findings. So briefly talking about our standards, which are, uh, which is an important discussion about this, Joint Commission International has 299 standards uh, with 1,272 measurable elements. And as you can see here, they're really divided into two categories. Uh, there, there's two ways to sort of describe this as the patient-centered standards and the organizational management standards. Or another way to look at it is on the left is process and on the right is uh, structure. But as you can see under patient-centered standards, they include things like the international patient safety goals, patient-centered care, the actual care provided to the patient, medication management and their use, uh, anesthesia and surgical care. So these are all the things that touch the patients directly. On the right-hand side under the management standards, it's much more about the structure behind it, the governance and leadership uh, and direction of an organization, quality and patient safety structures and function within the hospital or, or uh, the organization the facility management and patient safety uh, or fire safety and things like that, information management and uh, staff credentialing and the like. So of the 299 standards, they're, de they're uh, developed down into those categories. This is a unique tool to joint commission and we use it both domestically and internationally. It's the survey findings, uh, the survey uh, analysis for evaluating risk and uh, it is really, we call it the SAFER matrix, as someone had spent uh, you know, time in the Navy, an acronym is really important, hence the SAFER, uh, referring it to that way. But it's really a tool that we use to provide organizations after survey of how everything falls out. Uh, as an emergency physician, you, could, you can think of it in terms of triage, but uh, if you have a number of findings, then what do you focus on? Where do you spend your effort? Uh, you can't take a list of findings and do all of things all at once. And so this is really a tool to categorize them in terms of risk. And we use the multicolored chart uh, that you see, and there's two axes, so hopefully you can read it, but the um, x-axis is how widespread a finding is within an organization. And, and it could be limited uh, pattern or it could be widespread. And then the vertical axis is the likelihood for harm to patients or staff. And we categorize them as low, moderate, and, and high. And then the findings are each placed under uh, one of those categories, one of those nine blocks. Technically there's 10, the top is immediate threat to life, which is we come in and see something that's so dangerous uh, in an organization that we put an immediate stop to things. But the two examples that are there uh, in the bottom left corner is a, what is considered a low risk, a limited uh, 
scope finding, and it happens to be uh, we document the fact that there was no eyewash stations in a uh, specific room. Obviously it has issues, but relatively low risk given its proximity and the type of finding. As compared to the upper right corner, which is a high risk widespread finding, which is a, a lack of documentation of a protocol for sterilizing uh, instruments, uh, single use instruments properly. You can see where A, the risk of infection to a patient is high and that it can occur in many places. So this tool is used to grade a survey, but we also, um, <clears throat> I use this tool as you'll see in the next slide on how we looked at the top 10 findings for 2022. So moving forward, this is now the top 10 frequently scored findings in 2022. And to put it in perspective, uh, there were 5,457 standards were scored in uh, 2022. And for those that are doing math in the audience and you remembered how we did 206 surveys, that works out to uh, 26 and a half uh, citations scored per survey. Um, I, we have taken, my expert team has taken this information and, and prioritize the number of findings. And you can see the number one uh, scored finding was actually management of hazardous materials. The least, uh, you know, the number 10 on the list was management of the safe and concentrated electrolytes. But it's not just the numbers. In the top, you saw 259 citations. But look at, look at the color codes. Small percentage of them were in the, the red or the high risk uh, uh, widespread findings versus the management of a concentrated electrolytes, which is uh, significant numbers are uh, high impact uh, widespread. So those are the two filters we use when I narrow this list down a little further. So I'm limited now to going down to three specific sets of findings. And these are the ones that directly impacted uh, patient safety, which is process to identify suicide risk and self-harm, management of the uh, safe use of concentrated electrolytes, and the proper storage and management of medications. So let's take a little closer look at uh, these three items. So number one on the list, risk of suicide or self-harm. And of that, 2.6% of findings were associated with that, um, and over 95% of them were uh, moderate to high risk for patients. That's a real important factor. As an emergency physician, it's something near and dear to my heart. Um, but some of the samples of what we found were, um, in the, particularly in the emergency department where these patients get evaluated initially, is there's a single bathroom for them to use, and they get to use it unmonitored. Uh, there are potential for them to uh, ligature risks where they could hang themselves uh, or harm themselves differently because nobody is watching them. The, uh, another uh, high risk finding in emergency departments with uh, mental health patients is they're not watched or you know, once, once they've been determined to be at risk for self-harm, they need to be watched one to one. And, and you can't leave a family member as that person. You, know, you suddenly have a parent or a grandparent trying to uh, monitor someone who's at risk for hurting themselves, that is, an, that is a frequently cited finding and is a very high risk situation. And I can personally tell you I've seen bad outcomes as a result of that. And then in, in another area that's uh, cited as a high risk is uh, the various ligature risks uh, where you, know, you, you would be surprised at how inventive a truly suicidal patient is in terms of finding a way to kill themselves. Uh, they'll hang themselves on, on door hinges using sinks. They'll find weapons. They'll find ways to injure themselves in the emergency department. So securing those, doing the risk analysis is highly important. A suicide in a hospital is a sentinel event and needs to be reported and evaluated and, and really requires a, uh, a full RCA um, afterwards to, uh, to prevent it from happening further. Second one, <clears throat> concentrated electrolytes. Uh, again, uh, 91 uh, of these findings were associated with uh, uh, electrolyte, um, um, concentrated electrolytes. Over 95% of them posed a high risk um, to patients, uh, potential to do harm. And 
it's usually around the storage and labeling of these uh, electrolytes that, that are the problem. As you can see here, um, they're not separated. You know, potassium, yes, it's potassium, but uh, highly concentrated potassium, as you know, infused in, instead of diluted, causes uh, significant uh, arrhythmias and the like. So we, we frequently see that they're not segregated from other medications. We frequently see them not labeled appropriately that requires dilution, which uh, is, you know, is how they're properly, supposed to be properly used. And we also frequently find that hospitals have not developed uh, standardized protocols for the administration and mixing and things like that. And if, and if you really take a look at this one, you know, I, I realize that the uh, management and the evaluation and protection of a suicide or mental health of a suicidal patient is very difficult. There's a lot of touch points and, and you know, physical things that you need to worry about in terms of analysis. This is really relatively straightforward and easy to do if you actually try to do it. Finding a place to store them separately, labeling them properly, and developing a protocol on how to use them. I, I think we could all agree, technically not difficult to implement, yet frequently cited and a high potential for harm. So I, I highlight that one for a reason as well. And then lastly, uh, medication management. And this is, in, uh, I've run a, number, a couple of hospitals in my time. This was always our weak point. We, uh, there's too many ways to injure patients uh, by the improper uh, management of medications. And we see that internationally. It wasn't just my facility, I had company. Uh, but as you can see, uh, 2.2% 2, 2 .2 of uh, all findings were associated with medication management. Uh, one of the big issues is narcotic drug reg uh, registers, managing narcotics, logging them, tracking them. It, they're easy to divert. I realize it may be a bigger problem in some countries than other, but again, that is a technical control solution uh, that needs to be done. It, and white out is not appropriate, you know, to cover it up or striking it out. You need a good documentation system to manage it. Uh, the others are really involved the storage of medications, ensuring that they're controlled, you know, humidity, controlled environments, uh, temperature-wise. A failure to do so impacts the efficacy of, of many medications. Uh, I realize, again, in some places or other, it's, it's uh, uh, easier to, to do this, but at the end of the day, it's a storage issue, and it's a monitoring issue, and, and there's many technical solutions out there to do that. Um, and then. Frequently, what we do find is that organizations have actually implemented the monitoring of humidity or the monitoring temperature. They get notifications and they don't do anything with it. Oh yeah, it's, we were out of range in this time frame, but nothing's been done about it. So it's not just the implementation of the technical solutions, it's then monitoring and doing something with information. So again, um, found frequently has a definite impact on patient care and I would say there is remediation uh, in place. So the last thing I want to leave people with is a resource. Uh, I've hoped, you know, this information in terms of summary has been helpful of, you know, people want to know, quote, what's on the answer on the test. It's not a test. It's, it's really how do you ensure the quality and safety for every patient that walks in your institution. And that's what gets me up every morning to do, do my job is to know that I'm helping to do that in some form or the other. It's about the next patient. And so putting the right safeguards in place, putting uh, good practices, and building on what we learn each time we accredit or, or evaluate. But one of the questions that we get asked a lot, and I realize that people aren't aware of, is questions about our standards. Whether you're working on accreditation, whether you're an accredited organization, or you just want to learn more about what's behind a standard. You can go to our website, there is a, uh, within it is a place where you can, a uh, free resource where there's frequently asked questions about standards, particularly ones we get lots of questions on, but there's also a place where you can ask for help and ask about a standard, ask about an interpretation. You can, you can fill in directly on the, uh, on the site and my team will get back to you. Won't be me because I have much smarter people working for me, but we have a process to doing, for doing so and we encourage it because it disseminates knowledge and as a service uh, to organization as well. And in addition, we have uh, educational resources and things available as well. So I'll stop there, kept it hopefully on time, and hopefully imparted something that you will take back with you. So thank you very much.
Thank you, Dr. Jews.